text is Genesis chapter 6. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 5. We're going to read Genesis chapter 5 all the way through chapter 6, verse 8. If you are following along with us in our, our Pew Bible, you will find Genesis 5 through 6, 8 on page number 4. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God, male and female. He created them and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahalalel. Kenan lived after he fathered Mahalalel 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. When Mahalalel lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalalel lived after he fathered Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years and he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived, Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son. He called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. Now after Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive, and they took as their wives any of these, any they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. When the, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, these were mighty men who were men of old, men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, <clears throat> 
I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his Let's start with a word of prayer before we begin. God, we're grateful for continuation of following through this text of Scripture. We pray that you would help illuminate it, help make it applicable to our lives, help us understand your character through all of this, and that we might be able to live our lives in light of what you've revealed even to us today. Sometimes reading through genealogies can be a little bit more difficult, but uh, we ask for your blessing on your word and that it won't return void. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's Father's Day, and we have a genealogy of a whole bunch of fathers, so it's perfect, right? Just what everybody wants to hear on Father's Day, that all the fathers died. But, I mean, (laughs) so Chris kind of set me up for... Well, I won't say failure, but it's definitely a a steep hill to climb, I think. But what I'd like for everybody to do is take a a brief moment and think about the most interesting family story that you have. Like if somebody walked up and said, what's the most interesting thing that's ever happened in your family? Do you have something that just comes right to the top of your head? I want you to think about that because if given enough time, you probably could come up with some pretty good family stories, right? You know, maybe it's something in the far distance past, like you had a relative who researched genealogy and you found that you had an ancestor who traveled over on the Mayflower. That'd be a pretty cool family story. Or maybe your uncle happened to go on an African safari and got a lion and his lion head is on the mantle. That's kind of a cool family story. Maybe it's something big like that. Or maybe it's just that when you were helping your grandpa tear down the corn crib, there was a sea of rats that you stabbed with pitchforks. Maybe. Or maybe you happened to get stuck in your grandpa's creek in the mud and one of your girl cousins happened to rescue you. Maybe. So maybe it could be mundane, right? But we have stories. I'd like to share one of mine. My grandmother loved her self-appointed role as our family historian. And in researching our distant relatives and trying to track them down, she found one story that was particularly fascinating to her, and one that I still remember her telling me. So one of our relatives was named Bill Comstock. You know, run-of-the-mill, average American name. But he had a very particular nickname back in the 1860s. So... He happened to chance upon another person who had the exact same nickname. And in those days, you had six shooters, and it was kind of a big deal, right? So they decided to, uh, they agreed to uh, determine who would have the exclusive rights to the name by a shooting contest that would last eight hours. And at the end of the eight hours, a name would be determined and given to the winner, and the other one would have to go home and shame, right? The shooting match was how many buffalo they could kill in that day. My relative, Bill Comstock, went up against this other man named Bill. Unfortunately for my relative, the other Bill won by killing 20 more buffalo. And so the nickname, Buffalo Bill Cody, stuck with somebody who is not my relative. Now, while Bill Comstock is now an obscure historical footnote in the annals of time, he impacted me personally as a 15-year-old boy when my grandma told me the story because he kept his word. He gave the name up. And so that means a lot to me because he had character. 
in a day when he could have rode off into the sunset and nobody maybe would have ever even cared. And yes, that is a true story in case any of you are wondering. And it ties into the sermon today, which is the importance of family legacy. So since today is Father's Day, the message might be geared a little bit more applicationally to fathers, particularly given our text being a genealogy of fathers. But the truth really applies to everybody who's involved in family life, right? We're all involved in creating the legacy of our families, whether we're young or old, whether we're married or not. So family trees are often referenced as part of our heritage as various branches are created through birth and death and marriage. <clears throat> and that's actually the bulk of what our passage is today. So if you haven't turned to Genesis chapter 5, I'd ask that you do that now and follow along as we get started thinking about the importance of family legacy. <clears throat> Last week we looked at <clears throat> Genesis chapter 4, which detailed the account of Adam and Eve's sons, Cain and Abel, and... Um, how they began to relate to God and to each other independently. Unfortunately, we would remember that Cain didn't do so well in that situation, and the anger and jealousy within him drove him to kill his brother. So there's no happy family reunion coming out of Genesis chapter 4. Cain is sent to wander the earth alone <coughs> in disgrace. But as he does that, he strikes out and creates his own family. And we hear the account of how they became craftsmen and artisans and makers of metal. But at the end, there is a note of hope that Adam's family will eventually call again on the name of the Lord. And that's where we continue the story. So Genesis chapter 5 in verse 1. As we begin in verse 1, we're really changing scenes. So we followed Cain and his path of kind of destruction and killing his brother and what happened to him, and then his story kind of stops. And then we switch gears and we come back to Adam. So in verse 1, this is the book of the generations of Adam when God created man and he made them in the likeness of God, male and female. He created and blessed them and named them man when they were created. And when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his own image and named him Seth. So we start to see this transition into the next part of the story. It's a scene change. You know, typically when we start reading lists of genealogies, I mean, how many people typically just kind of skip over them? Anybody? A few? I got a few head nods, okay. Uh, Often we have a hard time knowing how they fit into the narrative and it seems to like slow you down from getting to the action where the swords are flying and Goliath's is being killed by David and that kind of stuff. But verses 1 and 2 are really important because it's the first genealogical account of the godly heritage of Adam. And while there was a, a very brief kind of condensed version for Cain, it was kind of like, well, this is what happened to Cain and his family. But here it's interesting because verse 1 starts off saying, this is the book of the account of the generations of Adam. So it seems like while they didn't have books the way that we think of them with covers and pages, there was some sort of chronicle, some sort of recording, whether it was oral or they put it on tablets. However they recorded it, it got recorded to the point that they eventually put it into some sort of form of writing. So there was some real record that was maintained and preserved throughout history. And it spans several generations from Adam to Noah, Adam to Noah in this particular passage. 
And this specific word generation appears 10 times in Genesis, usually when recounting family histories like we have here. And this is the first time it's used in this sense here in verse 1. And so it's really setting the stage for tracing Adam's lineage throughout the rest of the Bible. And it's really one of those threads that weaves the whole Bible together. That makes this really important, as much as genealogies sometimes are boring. And the reason it's important is because of the end of verse 1 where it says, God created them in his likeness. So we are getting the account of how God created the world and what happened next. Adam did not enter the world being born to parents. He was created directly by God. So this genealogy accounts for his unique origin. And it's interesting to note that Eve isn't left out in the genealogy because he created them male and female. And he created them. So there's the use of the plural is indicating that God brought both into existence at the same time to start the whole process. So I want to pause right here and start with our first application. Let's see if this is working. So there's a few things. I'll hit applications as we go through. So this isn't quite a typical three points in a poem sermon today. But I'm going to draw out some applications from the text. And the first one is that to create and prioritize our own family legacies, we really should be setting aside time to remember. Do we do that? I mean, how many of you have a great uncle or some long distance cousin or something that you've interacted with or a grandpa who happened to be in a war or did something really unique and interesting and you always wanted to go and sit and hear their stories? There's a lot of legacy that comes from remembering what has happened. And particularly, From a Christian perspective, it's not just remembering that one time, you know, you lost two of your front teeth because you whacked it on the flagpole, right? It's not necessarily those, though though they are fun stories to recount and tell. But particularly for us as Christians, it's remembering a legacy of God's faithfulness. And that's how this story of generations begins, is that God created And he continued to faithfully preserve the generations of Adam moving forward. When we share our family history, it's a way to make connection and strengthen those relationships, to bind us together. And our culture is so good at driving us apart. Maybe you don't have a shared history for your family yet. You can start right now. Begin by looking into it. Begin by making it a priority. Begin by doing something. I can't say that I'm super great at doing this yet in my family, but if you ask my kids about raccoons and watermelon, I'm sure they'll tell you the story. So there are some family stories that get passed out and recounted and laughed about. So as you think about the importance of family legacy, Set aside time to remember. Remember your own personal stories and remember God's faithfulness. We'll move on to verse 3. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness and named him Seth. Now this one's interesting because instead of being born after the likeness and image of God, Seth was now created and formed out of the likeness and the image of his father, Adam. 
So there's a change, and it starts to clearly denote a distancing from God. Because now there is this connection not directly with God in the same way. Because Seth now is following after Adam in his sinful state. And he's propagating a path that can lead away from God. The remainder of the genealogy follows Seth's descendants then, down through Noah. And over the past couple weeks, looking at the fall in the garden and Cain and Abel and Lamech, um, towards the end of Cain's descendants, there's this pattern of sinfulness that is starting to pervade all of the stories. And Adam's family line on this side is not immune to that. It creeps in. And Adam's sin has been passed down to Seth and his descendants because they are now imperfect. And that imperfection is being passed on through the rest of their generations. Verses 4 and 5. And then the days of Adam were 800 years. He had other sons and daughters. And he lived to the ripe old age of 930. Adam continues to grow his family. Uh, it's interesting to note that he had other sons and daughters, so the women folk aren't left out. This just confirms that the pattern is now being set and established. That men and women marry, men and women have sons and daughters, and they go out and they marry. And on and on the generations are to continue. But now the likeness is not directly the likeness and image of God, but it's the likeness and image of our parents. And here it says that um, well, the next application, I guess, is what we'll move to. Adam had other sons and daughter, and they all were produced in his own image and likeness. And I think there's, there's a pattern that starts here and gets replicated over and over. But we need to be intentional about how we set our examples. If we just look at Cain's example from last week, he set an example, he wandered off on his own, and his descendants kind of tended towards a certain disposition. And as we'll look further into this story over the next few verses, we find that Adam and Seth have set a different pattern, and there's a different disposition that arises. Adam passed on his life that he was trying to model after God, which he did imperfectly. And his, chimps, his children only got a glimpse of God. Not in the same way, not in the Garden of Eden, not walking with him in the cool of the day. But they see him through the way that Adam talked to them and described him and connected with him. But as we go, we end up becoming more like our biological parents than like God as we grow. In my own life, when I was living back home around my parents, I remember coming into the, the adult age and walking through a particular town, and my dad's name is Tim, and somebody called out, Hey, Tim! And then turn around right away. But I remember that the person caught me, and they said, You look just like him. You talk just like him. Some of your mannerisms are just like him. We often have those reflexive mannerisms that mimic our parents. And I think sometimes we get caught in just responding to everything that we don't think about being intentional. So as we're thinking about the importance of family legacy, are you just responding? Responding? 
or are you intentionally modeling? Are you leaving the right example? My sons are starting to pick up some of my sayings. Might be good, might not be so good. But even in preparing this, this message, I started reflecting, am I taking enough time to make sure that I'm being intentional about what I'm modeling and that I'm not just responding or reacting to the world around me? Because that responsive, reactive type of thing is what Cain did in the moment. It's what Lamech did in the moment in chapter 4. They went with a gut feeling without really thinking about it. And people died. So a small encouragement to be intentional about your example, about how you model living being in the image of your parents, but all the way back to Adam, being in the image and likeness of God. So we went kind of slow here at the beginning to set the stage, but I'm really kind of kind of take the next chunk from verse 6 all the way through 24 because there's a lot of similarity. All right? And so this is where we tend to skip things over. And I'm not trying to skip things over. But we see that Seth fathered a son Enosh, and Enosh fathered a son Kenan, and Kenan fathered a son Mahaliel, who fathered a son Jared, and Jared fathered Enoch. And thus all the days of Jared were 962, and when Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. And so there's a point in the story where it's important that we have the connection. We need to know who's connected to who. And the Bible does that. But they don't go into any more detail about these individuals because other than us knowing the direct line of descendants, there isn't anything else that we necessarily need to know about these individuals. And so for the sake of the sermon today, that's about all I'm going to say. Because they're providing the connection. They're providing the bridge from our actual current history right now all the way back to Adam. And it's one of the coolest things is if you go in the Bible and actually read all the genealogies and trace it all the way out up to Christ. And that's really the point is that even all the way back then, they were keeping a record and that record was preserved so that we can know that Christ was a real person born of thousands of real people. So they're not unimportant, but the Bible gives them their space and their credit to help build those bridges. But it isn't really until we get up to Enoch in verse 21. He occupies the seventh position in the genealogy here, chronologically and he's significant not for what he did necessarily here in scripture but for what God did in recognizing his devotion and dedication his faithfulness in walking with God the text here says in verse 28 uh, no I jumped too far I'm sorry um, in verse 24, that Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. So the understanding that most interpreters have is that God caught him up and raptured him away, just like the rapture we will experience someday when Christ returns. And he got to skip over the whole dying part. Lucky dude. The only other person like that was Elijah. But there's a little bit of a comparison here where um, in the, the seventh generation of Cain, there's a person whose name is Lamech. 
and he talks about how he killed somebody and how he was right in doing so. And so there's this contrast that the Bible seems to be drawing between the generations and multiple generations later, it's kind of like a spot check. Like, how are they doing? Where are they at? We find Cain's descendants killing each other. And we find Seth's descendants walking with God. And really, that it's only a verse. And it's not that long in either of their cases, but it's just a small check to say, kind of going back to that being intentional about your example, your example will have generational impact down the line. So what you're doing today really matters. Sometimes it doesn't feel like that. We're busy, we're rushed, we've got to get out the door, we've got to get in the car, we've got to get to the appointment. But all those little things add up. Because what gets modeled is what gets taught. You can tell your kids, but they're going to copy what they see. And that brings us to the next application, which is that as we think about the importance of building a family legacy, we want to make sure that we are walking with God. Enoch is kind of this example in the middle where what is the one attribute that gets highlighted? That he built the city? Like when you look at all Cain's descendants, it's like, oh, cool, they made all the instruments and they made all the armor and they made all the cities. They did all this stuff. We get to Enoch. What did he do? He walked with God. Three words. And what did he leave behind? That's what the next verses are talking about, so we'll get there. But. but if you think about Cain's descendants, and we're thinking about this idea of a family legacy, what did they leave behind? A city? We can drive over and see it now. We can drive over and see the tools they made or the instruments they made. No. They had an impact on the world for creating the society that we live in. But the specific things they made, they don't exist anymore. And that's true of our own lives. You know, I love tending our garden. And I love seeing all the stuff jump out in the spring. I hate the weeding, thanks Adam, but, but it's exciting to see that something is being accomplished, that something is happening. But at the end of the season, we harvest it, and it's over. It's transitory. Our lives are that way. There's so much in this particular passage, I, I hope that I can cover everything. Chris gave me a lot to cover. But when we think about walking with God, what kind of a legacy do you want to leave with your family, with your children, with your relatives? That you built a city? You passed off a whole bunch of wealth? Or that they can say, when you pass from this earth to meet your maker, everyone around you would say, wow, they walked with God. I'm so grateful for that example. I'm so grateful that that is the legacy I can remember. 
That brings us to verse 25 then. And we'll kind of go through 25 to the end of the chapter. And so we have Methuselah being the next person who gave birth to Lamech. And Lamech had a son. And then we get another slight pause in the narration. So instead of just continuing with the son's name and then Lamech dying, is we get kind of a, a peek into when Noah was born. And Lamech is naming Noah, and he says, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. And they, Lamech went on living for a while longer, and then he died. And so these last couple of verses close out the genealogy, and the record keeping has a small pause with this naming encounter. Uh, Noah's name is actually slightly based on the Hebrew word for rest. It's not exact, but it's pretty close. So it seems like they're kind of, Lamech's kind of doing a play on words where he's trying to communicate that idea in Noah's name, but then also makes this statement that he will bring us relief, that he'll bring us peace, that he'll bring us rest. When we get ahead a little bit further, um, and as Chris read this morning, we find that humanity is utterly wicked, and God is being grieved in his heart. Lamech is living in that world. And the idea that a deliverer will come through the generations of Adam is still alive, and there's that hope that Lamech is giving. That we live in this cursed world, but maybe this is the one. And there's always this continual looking for the one who will bring deliverance. And Noah does in a fashion just probably not quite the way that Lamech was hoping. But the idea from Genesis chapter 3 and that God's promise in crushing the serpent's head seems to be being passed down, that the curses of this world would be overcome to some extent. And this godly heritage is being passed down from father to son to grandson to great-grandson all the way down to Noah. So Lamech passes from the scene. We get to verse 32. And after Noah was 500 years old, he fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Probably weren't triplets. Just a summary of the kids who ended up getting on the boat. So we're, we're, being ident we're getting that identity. Um, were they his first kids? Maybe. He might have just been a late bloomer that way. I mean, 500 years is a while. So we don't know too much about Noah's backstory, other than what the Bible does give us is what's pertinent for what's coming. And really, that's the next application, is from Enoch to Methuselah to Lamech to Noah, there is this idea that there's hope. And that's kind of where we end chapter 5, is Lamech giving his son the name Rest. And wanting to communicate to the world that perhaps this is the one. You know, when we look around our society, as we see it today, I don't know that we're super far afield from the days of Noah. There is a lot going on in our world that is likely grieving God's heart in the same way. So, how are we doing with that? Are we quick to point out how bad everything is? Are we really just complaining about everything all the time? Just venting our frustrations? You know, sometimes there's a place and a time for that. 
But are we really considering our words and our attitudes? And are they reflecting that we are living with hope? We have a greater hope within us. Lamech gives words to that. It, living in the midst of depravity and sinfulness to the point that God's like, well, we've got to start all over. Lamech is still looking to the hope that God promised. Have we lost sight of that in our own day and age? Lamech didn't. Noah doesn't. We shouldn't either. And that's part of having this family legacy that we pass on. We can prioritize it and make it happen by living with hope. Does that weave itself into your conversation? Does that show up in the way that you interact with the trials and tribulations in this world? Or are we just burdened down by what we just see in front of us? That is the main part of the message, covering all of chapter 5. And so there's four applications, I think. We'll just kind of summarize them because they're up there. We need to set aside a time to remember. We need to be intentional about our example, what we model. We need to walk with God. And I think we need to live with hope. Count it all joy when you face trials. We have hope that should give us joy because we know the end of the story, no matter what we might be facing right in front of us. That's not always easy. That could almost be the whole sermon right there, I think. But Chris wants to cover more stuff, so we're not done yet. Pastor Chris wanted me to... Um, cover verses 1 through 8 in chapter 6. So we can roll over into chapter 6 now. And really, the genealogy in chapter 5 is kind of the big picture view. And now we're kind of taking a pause and kind of giving a little bit of background of what's been going on more globally rather than just within that local story of Adam's family. So when we get over to Genesis 6, 1, we find that man began to multiply on the face of the land and the daughters were born to them. So they're doing what God created them to do. He said, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. So they're doing that. There, there is something that man is accomplishing that is what God required of us. Go team Adam. Like, good work. But then we get to verse 2. And it says, The sons of saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any that they choose. When we get here, this idea of attraction, uh, it's really they saw beautiful women, and it's not any different than what happens in our own culture. You're walking down the street, somebody catches your eye, you're single, they're single, and they say, Hey, Maybe we shouldn't be single anymore. So that's what's happening, right? The interesting part is uh, the, the descriptors. And that's where this passage gets a little bit more interesting because it's the sons of God saw the daughters of men. And so what does that mean? Well, many theological textbooks have been written on these phrases. And unfortunately, I don't want to keep you here all day and bore you out of your mind. So I'm going to try to condense it as much as possible, right? But there's a few interpretations, and it really focuses on the phrase, sons of God. And it's been interpreted a few different ways over the millennia, like going back a long time. So one view, um, which some ancient Jewish interpreters uh, put forward, is the idea that the phrase, sons of God, is 
referring to human judges or important rulers, kind of this ruling class of leaders. And so that makes them different than the regular peasant people, the daughters of men, like the regular people. And so because of this positional status, they were trying to have some sort of title given to them. And that finds its basis in Psalm 82, where judges are referred to as gods and sons of the Most High. And so there's a little bit of textual um, support for that. <clears throat> uh, another view, which might be one of the oldest ones, and is found in uh, First Enoch and Jubilee, and um, is talked about by several of the early church fathers, and probably is the majority position of many people, um, based on what I've read up to this point, is the argument that sons of God is referring to angels. And so angels uh, came down from heaven and got married to the daughters of men. And so um, that argument primarily found, is found textually in Job chapter 1 and 2, where it says that um, God met with the sons of God, and they had a meeting. And so and then it says, and Satan came also. And so there's this idea that there's heavenly messengers that are having some sort of meeting with God. And because that phrase is really only used in that context, it seems that God's spiritual court being called the sons of God is also being referenced here in Genesis. This one gets a little bit more complicated because in um, the New Testament, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and Jude 5 through 7 kind of reference this same time period. Um, Second Peter, uh, Peter is talking about how difficult days are coming for Christians and how people will deny the faith and deny Jesus Christ and the gospel and be led astray by false teachers. So that's the context. We don't necessarily need to jump all the way to the New Testament today, but um, giving some credence to this position I wanted to read that for you. So 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. But false prophets arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies and deny the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. And their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So this is kind of the context. There's false teachers creeping in to the church, and Peter's warning them. And then we get to verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment... Then it continues, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And it continues, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making an example of them of what was going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, being righteous, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion, passion and despising authority. Now, why did I read all that? In most of the commentators, they kind of turn to this passage and say, see, the angels sinned in verse 4, and then in verse 5 it talks about Noah. And so since the angels were sinning, and this goes back to that interpretation of sons of God. And so they're kind of making the connection that if sons of God in the Old Testament refers to angelic beings, i.e. Job, then this kind of gives us an explanation of what happened for the sons of God in Genesis. So um, there's a lot of interpretation that's required to make that leap because Peter doesn't talk about it specifically but textually it seems like there's a negative example the angel sin and then there's a positive example where Noah's saved and then there's another negative example where Sodom and Gomorrah the people there are sinning and they're judged 
and then there's a positive example where Lot saved. And because of that kind of back and forth positive negative, it seems that Noah's story would float out in nothingness by itself if you didn't connect the angels to the sons of God here in Genesis 6. If you're with me still, I just got to flip my page. And they're in Jude and Enoch, they basically, uh, the Jude passage is very, very similar. It's a little bit shorter. And in Enoch, it basically gives all of the detail that kind of ties the story together. And I'm not going to take the time to read that here today. But in try, when you take all of those pieces as a whole, it seems like Peter could be connecting these sinning angels that are talked about in Second Peter to the story of Noah. And one of the reasons um, interpreters kind of think that this is a separate sinning group of sinning angels is that in the Old Testament there's no story of angels falling from heaven. So it talks about Lucifer um, being cast out, but not all the other angels. That comes in the New Testament, so it's something later. <clears throat> so Peter's audience would only have the Old Testament to reference. And so it seems like there's a common understanding of this story that isn't found in the Old Testament but has been passed down as some other tradition. So there's a third interpretation. So that's an, the second one. There's a third interpretation, and that's the phrase, the sons of God, refers to those who are just worshiping God faithfully. And that kind of goes within the context of there's kind of Cain's descendants who kind of go off on their own way and leave God behind. And then we see this genealogical history of Adam where these kind of God-fearing people are trying to maintain a tradition of closeness and walking with God. And this position is held by some of the church fathers like Augustine and reformers like Luther and Calvin. And so... Th all of these different interpretations are held by a lot of people who all disagree with each other. Um, this one really just appeals to the plain reading of Genesis. So if you didn't have the New Testament and you didn't have the book of Enoch and you didn't go looking in Psalms or Job, how would you interpret this particular passage? And this one would seem to make the most sense just staying in the context. So in the end, that doesn't really help us get to determining which one it should be. Because all of them are kind of open to interpretation because the Bible itself doesn't specifically make it super clear. The main difficulty, even though it's the majority interpretation, the main difficulty with um, the angel view is that um, there's a few challenges with that one, even though it, it, it really is the prominent view. The first is that um, it seems to change the plain reading of Genesis in the context. Um, the second is that, there's, that this would mean there's a different fall of sinning angels. And in the context, it would seem hard to believe that Moses would call these fallen angels sons of God if they had already fallen and were doing these evil deeds. Um, it seems like another term would have been used. Because in the Job context, when it talks about the sons of God had gathered, Satan is off by himself. And it says, and Satan also. So Satan isn't included in the sons of God. And so there's some textual things there that, um, that add some difficulty. And third, the New Testament writers, both in Jude and Peter, don't talk about it other than angels fell, but they could have specifically referenced Genesis chapter 6. Um, and they don't other than referencing Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah, but Sodom and Gomorrah comes a lot later, and so there's 
It's kind of trying to understand what are they trying to get after. And I don't think the point is them trying to get their readers to understand something new about Genesis as much as it is to show God's faithfulness through different trials. Um, so there's a few difficulties there. But could it be angels? I suppose it could be. Could it just be a godly line noted as the sons of God? It could be. Could it be rulers or judges? It could be. And unfortunately, the Bible doesn't tell us explicitly. So at the end of the day, it appears that these sons of God, and this is the key point, they are wrongly following Eve's path. So whether they're angels or not, and I'm, I'm more leaning towards personally, which is the minority opinion, that it really is just following Seth's lineage and that they are real people. Because Eve's path was that she disobeyed God and pursued what her eyes saw. And whether it's angels or people, it doesn't really matter because it's the same sin. In the text, it's they saw women to be attractive and they went and married them. And this, um, this idea is that that became the focal point. Have you ever looked at something and just wanted it? Every time I see a Camaro drive by, eh, I sure would like to have one of those. Will it ever happen? Probably not while I have kids. Unless I have a rich uncle that I don't know about yet in my genealogy. But, but the idea is that the word is good. They were attractive, they were beautiful, they were good, and they took them as wives. But what they were looking at was this external representation. And I think that's the main point of those verses. It's not whether it was angels or humans. It's that their focal point was an external thing that led them to make a decision without consulting God. They did not think down the road far enough. Eve saw the apple, saw that it was good, it was beautiful, and she took it. She did not think about the consequences. These sons of God saw that these women were beautiful, they were good. They took them. They didn't think about the consequences. So in the end, they ended up marrying for the wrong reason. And it produced the wrong result. So there's a whole bunch of time for just two verses. But it's kind of this weird, obscure, complicated passage where there's lots of interpretations. That gets us to verse 3. Where the Lord says, My spirit shall not abide with man forever, for he is flesh, and his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and afterward, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, and these were the mighty men of old and of renown. And this is where this kind of obscure passage, which kind of functions as a little aside from the genealogy and the story of Noah. It's kind of like, this is kind of what's going on in those days. It's that broader picture. So again, we kind of flip back to God interjecting. And he's seeing that these sons of God are taking these daughters of men and God is contemplating that their lifespans should change. In chapter 5, if you go through and average everybody's ages, the average age is 702. It's higher if you take off Enoch, but technically he left, so he had a terminal date too. When we get up to chapter 11 in Genesis, which we should get to maybe eventually, if that's where Chris is going with going through the whole book, um, people are only averaging 290 years a time. So when you're talking like a 450-year change, you know, that's, that's a big swing. 
pretty significant. Um, so there's obviously changes after the flood. And historically, the Sumerians kept track of people's ages, and they have histories of people living great lengths of age before a flood and them being shorter after a flood. But it's interesting that God intervenes here and he creates this limitation that life is now capped at 120 years. And this also has several interpretations, and I won't go into all of them at length, but basically um, I found four. Some understand that this is just a myth. They're just making up the numbers to make God seem super cool. Um, some people think that it really is just a legend story and that the people didn't even exist. Others view that since the pre-flood environment was this unique time before God kind of remade the world, it allowed for growth due to the biological nature of the earth. And that after the flood, people couldn't grow and live as long because the ecology changed, um, the ecosystem and the climate. And the last one is that they're just real people who had real ages and they really lived and they really died. And that would be the view that we take. But there are a lot of different interpretations over all that. The main problem with the last interpretation is that right away God makes the statement that lifespan now is supposed to be capped at 120, but it doesn't happen right away. So, I mean, Noah lives longer. Shem, Ham, and Japheth live longer. Um, and even later on in the biblical narrative, there are other people who live exceptionally longer than this. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. So there's several other people who live longer than this time span. And when we get up into the time of the Psalms, in Psalm 90, verse 10, there's a statement that says that um, everyone's life is now 70 or 80 years. And if you look at typical lifespans nowadays, I mean, I think it's 73 or 4 for guys and 78 or 9 for women. So we kind of fall into this average, but that's not the 120 that God said. But there's not necessarily a promise that everybody gets to live all the way to 120 years. And I'm going to step aside. This is just my own personal speculation. But I wonder if God allowed for the 700 plus year lifespans to allow the earth to more easily populate. I mean, if you have to wait for all of your new prodigy to get to childbearing age, like it kind of slows things down. But if you can live 900 years and you can have kids at 500 like Noah did, you can more easily populate the earth. So I think there might have been something to that. And on the flip side, I think that God is seeing how evil people are becoming. And at some point, this changes, and God doesn't give us a date when it happens, but I think he's capping how evil we can become. I mean, if you think of all the knowledge you could accumulate in 900 years, all the good you could do, but oh, how much evil. And I think God maybe is limiting our bent toward evil by giving us those shorter lifespans. But that's just my own personal interpretation there, I think. So we get to verse 4 and the Nephilim. So they were on the earth in those days and also afterward. I want to just talk about those two phrases, in those days and afterward. So we have this Nephilim statement. We don't really know who they are, random name. It only appears one other time in Scripture, and that's in Numbers chapter 13 when the spies are scouting out the land. The ten spies come back and they're like, The Nephilim are in the land! We're grasshoppers! <laughs> that's the only other time it's mentioned. So it's starkly different than this one, where the, in this story it, it continues, and these were the mighty men of old, the men of renown. So the spies aren't coming back and being like, look at those really cool old guys. They're coming back scared. And 
There's a whole lot of interpretation that goes into that, and for the sake of today, all I'm going to say is I think that there was a group of people called the Nephilim, right? Obviously. And there were stories that were passed down. So when the spies come back, I think that they're really coming back and they're recounting the tall tales that they've heard. Because when they're coming back, they're coming back scared. And the way that they're verbalizing their communication is that this will be bad for us. Sort of like, I just saw, I just saw Bigfoot. We better not go over there. Better not do it. That'd be bad. And I think that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to kind of conjure up these old stories that have probably turned into lost legends based on real people. But it is interesting that a, this is, Numbers is a thousand years later. So a thousand years later, a whole millennia, the Israelites still understood what that word meant, and it communicated something. And um, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, most of the time this ends up getting translated as giants, um, even back to um, in Genesis. And that's where we kind of get this idea that the Nephilim were these giant people. And if we just take the observation of the spies, where they say we were like grasshoppers to the people who lived in the land, the Nephilim, it seems that their observational skills were saying these were giant people. And that's kind of where we get that association. Now, there is one slight interpretive aside because of that sons of God being potentially angels. Um, some of the interpreters think that the Nephilim became giants because angel dads and wife or human moms made these giant babies. And um, in all of my reading, I think that even if we just stick in the text of Genesis, that's not really possible because when it says in those days and also afterwards, it's saying that the context was they were already there when the sons of God and the daughters of men were getting together. And it becomes a time marker. Because in Hebrew, when you're connecting thoughts together, you always have and. And then Adam had a son. And then he had a son. And then, so that you have this chronological list. But when we get to chapter 4, there's no and. There's no vav. So it's the Nephilim. And it's like a hard stop. It's, I'm interjecting something new. But if you look up in chapter, or verse 2, you'll see what I mean. So it's, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took them as their wives, any they choose. So there, most of the time in Hebrew, whenever there's the and, and it usually starts a new sentence, often, you're trying to connect it directly back to what just happened. But here, when it talks about and in those days, almost all of the times, and I didn't get through all of the instances in the Bible because there's a lot of them, but in the ones that I surveyed, it's almost always a time marker saying, in that time when this other thing was happening, to give them a point of reference. It's like a landmark. And I think that's what the writer is doing is, it's a landmark. At the same time the Nephilim lived, the sons of God and the daughters of men were doing this other thing. Because then when you get to that last sentence, these were the mighty men of old and the men of renown. The idea seems to be that they've been around for a while, doing things that were pretty cool, contextually within the context. Because then it jumps out, so it's like small footnote, and then it jumps back to the story in verse 5. The Lord saw the wickedness of man. And it was great in the earth, and every intention of his heart was only evil continually. Oh, I think I missed. Ah, I've got three principles before we jump into verse 5. I'm almost done. I think there's three principles from just these four verses. And this, these four verses are kind of an aside to the story. But I think there's three principles. One, marriage for the wrong reasons will bring wrong results. 
And I think that's kind of the point is like, if you, if you go down that path, bad things will happen. And that's where we get to verse 5 because all of a sudden there's all this wickedness. And it's mainly because people were pursuing their own desires instead of God. The second principle is that God steps away when we move away. All these people were off doing their own thing. And God says, you know what? I'm going to limit your lifespan. You know what? I need to bring judgment on the world. The way that I think of God is not so much that he's always chasing us around like, you know, your two-year-old toddler, right? Who's opened the drawer and opening the door and breaking the thing. And you're running after him trying to stop him. God is much more like the grandparent sitting in the chair waiting for the toddler to come back to them to sit and have quiet time. Not because God is not active and involved. But he allows us to do the right thing but also gives us space when we do the wrong thing. And I think God is kind of stepping slowly away from the wickedness of the world, waiting for people to turn back to him. So if we apply that principle to you, where are you today? Are you stepping towards God or away from him? And the last one is some legends are real. I mean, the Nephilim, that's a real thing. And the spies in Canaan, they were super scared out of their mind. Now, whether it kind of became a myth and a legend at that point, it sure felt real to them at that point. And there were giants. We all know Goliath. And it seems that somehow they might be connected. But we don't have time to go down that rabbit hole today. So then if we get to verse 5, I think that we can get back to another application, which is we know that God cares about how we live. And that's verse 5 and 6. The Lord saw the wickedness of man and that it was great in the earth and that every intention and thought of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was grieved and sorry that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. God is disappointed. God is observing us. The utter and complete domination of sin over humanity is hurting God's heart. And yet, at the same time, it's arousing his wrath. In verse 6, when it says that it grieved him in his heart, it's the same word that they use for labor. It's meant to convey the pain of childbirth, the pain of rearing children, and yet as your heart grows more deeply connected to these little children, they have failures and trials, and your heart breaks. And yet God is trying to give us space to live our own lives. Lives where we want to be dedicated to him. But it brings him to the point, verse 7. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of heaven, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God's disappointment leads him to resolve to wipe out not only humankind, but all living creatures, which was our responsibility to take care of. If God has to wipe out all living creatures, we really didn't do a very good job. We couldn't even take care of ourselves. And the consequences carried over to our, our responsibilities, our stewardship. And yet, and yet, not all is lost. Because when we get down to verse 8, but Noah found favor with God. And this is more of a comment of how gracious God is to us. 
rather than Noah having some perfect merit that God noticed. The trajectory of sin that we saw from Adam through Cain is still impacting the world. And even Enoch and Lamech and Noah, they are pursuing faithfulness, but they're still under the same burden of sin, and the world isn't getting any better. So it's of note that here, Noah is not said to have earned God's favor. He didn't do anything to earn it, but God granted it to him. More could be said, but this is a long sermon from a long text. And I think that when we get to the end of the day, this is really the biggest piece, is verse 8. There's a but. The buts in the Bible are like the best. Because it's, but Noah found favor in God's eyes. It's a full stop to what's about to happen. Fortunately, I don't get to tell the rest of the story, which is kind of a bummer. But but God's mercy and patience come upon those to whom he finds favor. And I think this portion of Genesis is less about the line of Seth, though that's important. But it's about helping us know God better. Because we see how God created, how he preserved a lineage that will eventually lead to Christ. How he's pained in his heart over the sinfulness of humanity. And yet he's still full of compassion. Jumping ahead just a little bit. Noah does, the flood doesn't come right away. Like, there's decades where God's still patient with the world. He's merciful and gracious and patient and compassionate. He is slow to anchor, anger. O oh Lord, our Lord, he is compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but he will not leave the guilty unpunished. He will bring the father's iniquity on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. And this is the tension. We end chapter 6, verse 8 at. Is there's this tension where God is seeking to love and be compassionate and merciful. But judgment is coming. So, how can we be more like God? Would kind of be a final question. And what about connecting all of this back to a family legacy? So just as a reminder, I kind of had six points. The last, oh, the last two are up there, there. Three principles from the aside, but the six points are setting aside time to remember our own family legacy. Right? Got to make time. Not just the funny story. Ask the kids about the raccoons. But... What about our family legacy with God? Being intentional about our example. We have to model the right path. And we do that next by walking with God. Like Enoch. Like Noah. You have to know where you're going and how you're going to get there. Because it matters. And we have to live with hope. We have hope, so let's share it. Let's communicate it. And the last two are really knowing that God cares about how we live should motivate us to strive to have the right family legacy. And knowing that God is involved in our lives. All along the way, God hasn't disappeared. He hasn't gone anywhere. Sometimes he steps away. But it's not so much that he stepped away, it's that we stepped away from him. And he's waiting for us to re-engage, for us to turn closer to him, for us to be more invested in who he is. So, 
Do you think the, there's importance in creating a family legacy? I think there is. And so for today, on Father's Day, particularly to fathers, own it. Make it happen. Nobody's going to do it for you. You can delegate lots of other responsibilities, but if you don't do this, it won't happen. For wives, be involved. Guys are dense. Sometimes we need the elbow. But hold us accountable to this. Um, I pray that you would help enlighten it more than I was able to do in my own attempt this morning. But I pray that you would help us live out some of these applications from this passage. That you would help us invest in the importance of building a family legacy particularly a Christian legacy. We thank you for your love and your patience. And even as we got to the end, that the story is not yet over. And it's not over yet today. And we would ask that you would call people by your name 